friends welcome back to this lecture on human behavior this is lecture number 10 in the series and if you remember from the last lecture we were dealing with human memory so what we'll try and do in this lecture is we'll complete human memory now a disclaimer to start with for all the lectures that i'm doing in this series especially on human cognition can also be referred back to my other lecture which would be running uh, that is on course on cognitive psychology so what we are doing in this lecture on human behavior is just introducing the concept and if you want a little bit more or if you want to understand the concepts a little bit more you can always refer back to my lecture on cognitive psychology uh, which is on the internet and which is also uh, a course a MOOCs course on cognitive psychology it's called the introduction to cognitive psychology so before we go any further let us do a quick recap as we keep on doing in the other lectures of what we have done done up till now so we started off by dedicating two lectures to introducing the concept of what is human behavior and what do we do in the study of human behavior and there we introduced the concept of psychology what is psychology and what are its uh, basic uh, historical roots from where it comes and why should we study human behavior for all matters then uh, we looked at the two branches or two sciences from which psychology uh, evolved and i showed to you how psychology has its roots not only in philosophy but on physiology as well and so these are the two main branches from which psychology has evolved then we looked at some primary schools of psychology uh, not limiting to structuralism and functionalism which are the old schools but also extending to the idea of psychoanalysis and behaviorism and uh, gestaltism and so on and so forth and further to what we looked at uh, newer schools of psychology towards then this lecture we looked at experimentations of uh, how uh, studies are done in uh, psychology uh, which is basically using the experimental method or uh, the observation method or the correlation method and so on and so forth lecture number 3 and 4 were dedicated to understanding sensation which is the process of grabbing the physical stimulus and converting it into psychological uh, uh, medium or into the psychological framework and uh, there we looked at the process of sensation uh, and what are the parameters of any sensory uh, system so uh, we looked at two parameters one being the sensitivity and the other being the uh, sensory coding and uh, we not only looked at these parameters in detail but we also took a model of uh, sensory organ which is the human eye and tried to interpret all we had learned about sensory organs or the process of sensation and how the eye functions on those parameters or how the eye fits into that whole idea of how sensory systems work then we moved on to the concept of perception which is making meaning to sensations and we looked at the primary definition of sense, uh, perception we looked at perception from two viewpoints one was the global viewpoint the other was uh, the local viewpoint so global viewpoint uh, the or uh, we looked at perception from the ecological uh, point of view uh, from the idea that perception is uh, equivalent to anything or all information which is falling onto the retina or the eye so we don't need any kind of other information the retina of the eye is in terms of visual perception or uh, the eardrum in terms of auditory perception the information falling onto it is enough to create the world or make meaning of the physical stimulus and then we looked at the and the global view which says that perception is not something like this it's a five six step process so <clears throat> we moved on to looking at perception as a six part process uh, or five part process rather uh, starting off by uh, you know, looking at attention which is the first process in perception then moving on to something called localization and then to recognition further to abstraction and constancy we moved on to the section on learning which is basically uh, what is uh, done to all those perceptual uh, organizations to perceptual material so basically once you perceive something these uh, materials are learned and then they are stored so the next two chapters on learning and memory was how human beings deal with uh, physical stimulus which have been perceived or which have been 
uh, interpreted. So, learning, we, we looked at theories of learning in, in the chapter on learning, we looked at non-associative and associative forms of learning and uh, within the non-associate we look at sensitization and habituation and within the associative forms we dealt in detail the classical instrumental and uh, observation part of it. This was the whole idea of what we did in learning. We moved on to the idea of memory which is basically storing the learning. So, once we perceive something and we learn something about it or we collect knowledge about whatever has been perceived, it has to be stored somewhere and that is the process which we call memory. And so, the next section dealt in chapter number 9 or section number 9 was on memory. So, we started off by explaining what is memory is basic processes in terms of uh, encoding, uh, storage and retrieval. So, we did a detailed uh, analysis of what is encoding, what is storage and what is retrieval and how these properties or how these uh, processes rather uh, they combine together to form the concept of memory. Further to that, we also looked at two influential views or two models of human memory. One model being the Atkinson Schrieffen model which says that human memory has three parts, one is the sensory register, the other is the short term memory and the third one is the long term memory. And then we added on or we introduced another concept of memory which is called the network model of memory and we looked at how this network model or multiple processing model of memory, how defined by Rummelhart and how this model of memory differs from the idea of Atkinson and Schrieffen. And Towards the end of the last lecture, we looked at what kind of informations are stored into memory. So, we continue on in today's lecture from uh, where we left off in the last class. So, we were looking at uh, what are the kind of information which is stored in memory. Now, Atkinson and Schrieffen defined human memory as a three part system. The first part being the sensory register where all kind of information come in and they stay for very, very few uh, seconds or within partial seconds, but the amount the register is huge. So, it can take a lot of information and here the information that is gathered, the, the knowledge that is gathered is basically in the very raw form and that is why had, we had the echo and the icon which is the format in which the knowledge or external information is grasped. Then we talked about something called the short term store. The short term store or the short term memory as described in the Atkinson and Schrieffen model is a store. So, information stays here for uh, less than 30 seconds until and unless it is rehearsed. And these rehearsals are of two types. If we do maintenance rehearsal which is passively repeating the information again and again, then what happens is the information is remembered for more than 30 seconds for whatever period of time that we want. But if we do something called elaborate rehearsal which is making meaning or assigning meaning to the kind of information which is in the short term store, then it passes on to something called long term memory. So, this idea or this conceptualization of short term store or short term memory was what was done by Atkinson and Schrieffen. Now, Atkinson and Schrieffen believed that the short term store is a passive store and it can it not do anything on its own which basically means that information just stores on the short term store and nothing happens after that. But we are all aware of the fact that elaborate rehearsals happen. Now, how does the elaborate rehearsal happen? Uh, for example, the, the concept that we took in explaining attention and shift in model, we looked at storing a phone number. So, let us say this is the phone number and what attention and shift in says is that 7 plus or minus 2 chunks of item is, will be what is stored on a short term store or short term memory. Now, if we do elaborate rehearsal, suppose this is a number which is very dear to us. So, we will do an elaborate rehearsal. So, we will chunk the numbers together. How do we chunk the number? 9 4 is for BSNL, 3 5 is some state code, this is some city code and this is the number 8 5 2 3 is the number of the person who are whom you are calling. So, Basically, this type of rehearsal or this type of uh, elaborate rehearsal or assigning meaning requires you to borrow certain rules and certain concepts from long term memory. Now, the idea that 94 is related to BSNL or the fact that 35 is related to a particular state, let us say it is Gujarat for for any purpose. Now, the idea that 35 relates to Gujarat and 63 to Vadodara in Gujarat, I am just giving a definition and these ideas or these facts are stored in something called long term memory. So, according to the concept of what Atkinson and Stephen said that 
short term store is a store where information is stored passively the concepts don't fit which basically means that the short term store was doing more than storing information it was able to access long term memory at the run time which basically means that whenever information was processed for elaborate rehearsal or elaborate rehearsal was happening on short term memory the short term memory was doing more than just passively storing information and therein came the concept of working memory which was proposed by someone called Alan Bradley. So, the new conceptualization of short term store that is called the working memory was what was conceptualized and this working memory was known as the workbench of consciousness. So, let us look at what is working memory. So, initially working memory was confused with short term memory and refers to the temporary storage of limited information for very short duration of time as I explained to you. Now, working memory involves both storage capacity and the capacity to transform processes information held in memory systems. Now, as I said working memory is a dynamic store. The idea is that working memory is a dynamic store and how it is a dynamic store because it can both store information as well as manipulate information or transform information. So, there are two things that the short term store or the working memory uh, can do, but the short term store was not able to do that and that is why the conceptualization of working memory was actually thought of. Now, in a sense working memory is the workbench of consciousness, the place where information we are using right now is held in process and that is what the definition of working memory is all about. And so, not only numbers any kind of any kind of information which is assigned some kind of a meaning goes through the working memory and the working memory are is able to pull rules from the long term memory. Now, the very act that it can pull rules or it can actually refer to long term memory in terms of what certain stimulus mean or what kind certain kind of packets of information mean uh, provides it the dynamicity that we are talking about and so it was different from the idea of short term store. Now, early researchers on working memory. Now, to answer questions on the existence of storage capacity of working memory, the serial position curve, the greater accuracy of recall of words and other information early and later in list of information then in the middle of the list has been effectively used. Now, the question was my short term store could store 7 plus or minus 2 chunks of item. Now, as I defined what is chunks, chunk is basically information of same type which are organized together. So, uh, for example, if I have a list of animals and a list of birds and a list of food items, a list of furnitures and if there are 10 items in each list, if I give you an item or if I give these 4 lists for you to remember, what you will do? You will chunk them together. You will organize items which are similar together. For example, rat, hen, cat, dog will be put into animals and similarly, pizzas, burgers, fast food, fries will be put into food. So, this is basically what is called chunk and so what uh, Atkinson and Schiffman believe is that there are 7 plus or minus 2 chunks of items is what we can maximally store into the short term store. Now, recent researchers say that we can only store 4 plus or minus 1 item or the magical number 4 at, at is called. So, there is a work by Conan, another uh, psychologist working in the area of memory, a very recent paper of uh, his suggests that well, there are only 4 chunks of items that we can store in long term memory, but that is a whole other uh, ball game. So, the question was how many items are stored in working memory and for that the serial position, the idea of serial position curve was actually uh, introduced. Now, what is the serial position curve? Now, given the fact that and the serial position curve has also been established or it is the experiment which explained that there are two types of memory stores. So, how do psychologists, how did psychologists find out that human memory is a two or three part store or basically two part store which consisted of the short term store and the long term store or in our definitions the working memory and the long term memory. So, how was this uh, thing decided? Now, for that the answer comes from the study of something called the serial position curve. What happens in the serial position curve? So, let us say that I give you some 40 or 50 items, so you have 40 or 50 items in a list for, uh, for you to learn and once you learn this list, I will give you some break and after that you have to recall the list back or you have to um, provide uh, me the list members at the time of retrieval. So, at later point of time, uh, first I make you learn the list and at later point of time I ask you to retrieve the list back. So, if that is what my uh, uh, thing is or if that is what my experiment is, this is what has been found. Now, the probability of recall 
versus the position of words in the list follows a curve like this. And so if you look at the curve, what happens is items at the beginning of the list are, this is 40 and these are items at the top of the list. Right? So, as you can see, items which are at the very beginning of the list, they are remembered with a higher frequency and items which are at the uh, this end of the list or the towards the item number 3940. So, if you look at from item number 30 onwards to 40, they are remembered with a higher, if you look at the curve here, the slope of the curve, it is very high and if you look at the slope of the curve here for item number 1 to 5, so we have taken uh, 20 items, so let us take a 20 item curve and so slope of the curve something like this. If you look at the slope is generally higher, but look at the items which are in the middle of the list. Now, if you look at the item which is the middle of the list, the chances of them for, for being recalled is very low. So, what is happening now? Why is it that at items in the beginning of the list, for example, item 1 to 20 and then items number 30 to 40, 1 to 10 and 30 to 40, they have a higher recall. Of course, 10, 30 to 40 is the highest recall and 1 to 10 has the lowest recall. What is the reason for it? And the answer that was given is there are two stores. Now, what is happening is item number 30 to 40 are still in the short term store and still they are still being repeated. Now, since items have been just encountered with, when you are learning the list, the items that you are just encountered with, when you are still repeating it, what will happen is they will stay current in the store and so or they will stay current in terms of repetition and the chances are that you will remember them more. What is the answer to the fact that items number 1 to 10 are recalled with higher accuracy or uh, relatively higher accuracy? The answer to this lies in the fact that item number 1 to 10 have passed on from something called the short term store to the long term store. They have been already processed and some meaning has been attached to it and that is why they have moved from the short term store to the long term store and that is why the chances are the accuracy of them being recalled is very high. And this is the experiment, the idea of serial position curve is the experiment which gives you the fact that there are two stores or there are uh, human memory is divided into two stores. So, as you can see, the probability of recall varies with items position in the list with the probability being highest for last five or so positions. Now, next highest to are the first few positions and lowest for the intermediate position. So, that is what basically this and this experiment was done by someone called B.B. Murdoch. Now, again, if you want to look at the more details about serial position curve or the experiment by Murdoch, refer to my course on cognitive psychology if I have discussed in detail this kind of a concept. So, that is ba basically what how the existence of working memory or the existence of how dual system, dual store exist in memory came about. Now, what are the kind of information which is stored in the working memory? The multiple component model of working memory. So, how is the working memory first of all uh, designed? Now, if you look into the short term store, the short term store has different representations. It has the icon for visual information, the eco for uh, the auditory information and similarly other stores or uh, the other kind of uh, encoding methods or other kind of uh, encoding types for different kinds of information from different senses. Now, how does the short term store uh, tackle with this kind of information? Atkinson and Schiffen model believe that all information once it enter the short term store, they are stored in just one basic format which is called the phonological format, which is called the uh, auditory format. But that is where uh, Alan Bradley and the concept of working memory differs. They believe that items which are stored in short term memory, items which enter the short term memory, they are not in the phonological code. They are different codes of it and that is how the conceptualization of working memory came in and working memory was called the multiple component model. Now, current conceptions of working memory believe that working memory is conceptualized as being divided into something called the phonological loop and something called the visuospatial sketch pad. And what is the phonological loop? For storing and operating on information in an acoustic code and visuospatial sketch pad holds and operate information which is visual and spatial in nature. And so, what this says is that the idea of working memory, the concept of working memory works in this way that information which is coming from the short term store and which is in the form of an eco or the icon, these informations stay in the same format and that gets stored into two different operating systems or two different uh, processes within the working memory. There is something called the phonological store which stores only information in the phonological code, so auditory information and there is something called the visual spatial sketch pad which basically stores information in the visual and spatial nature and so there are two different stores which are existing in the concept of working memory. Mediated by different brain structures, phonological loop 
by the left hemisphere and visual spatial sketch pad by the right hemisphere. And so, if you look at not only the stores are different, so the audio information or auditory information or phonological information is governed by the left uh, brain hemisphere and the visual information is governed by the right hemisphere. This is different different brain regions or different different brain areas are, are responsible for the two stores which now says that when you actually go uh, storing information into working memory it is not one area of the brain which is responsible for storing information but different brain areas and different processes store information in working memory and now it actually is more believable. Why I will tell you? When we go to the movies, all of us know that pictures are faster. So, you have 24 frames. When, whenever you go to a movie, you have mostly 25, 24 frames per second, which is what the rate of pictures actually move. But if you look at auditory information, the dialogue which comes in, it is much, much slower. So, how is the brain able to uh, contemplate or match these two? two things together. The human eye can scan perceive images at the rate of 24 frames per second and the human ear is a single channel system. So, it is very uh, slow in hearing information. So, how does it maintain, how does the human brain uh, deal with this kind of delays which are there and the answer is in terms of working memory. There is a phonological loop which takes in information from the auditory senses and it keeps on repeating this information over and over again. Now, information in the phonological loop or information which is passed on the phonological loop is stripped off of its various grammars and only the basic grammar or the basic information is what is stored. For example, in verb, the noun, the verb, the object, these are the what is the information which is basically being processed. On the other hand, we have something called the visual sketch sketchpad which actually looks at or takes in 24 frames and stores it one by one and delays it. So, what it does is it processes and reprocesses or it creates a little bit of delay. So, this is how the central executive which is the top body or the working memory it keeps track of this audio and video and so you have the image and the video acting or uh, working at the same time and it gives the kind of pleasure that you get to see movies. Now, two subsystems controlled by the executive directs attention and decides what operation would be performed on the information. So, as, as I said the idea of working memory is that it is two system, two subsystems, the phonological loop and the visual sketch, sketch pad these two stores different different kind of information in them. But then uh, how or who decides which kind, of in, which kind of information should be picked up right now for making meaning or which kind of information should be delayed. That is done by a central system which is called a central executive. So, central executive sits right on the top and it decides what kind of information should be processed and what kind of information should not be processed. Now, additional components, episodic buffer has also been put as a new component which binds information or associations dif or different aspects from the memory. So, basically then this is what my idea or this is what Alan Bradley's Alan Bradley's idea of working memories. And so, how does it work? There is a central executive which gathers information from the short term store. So, my short term store has both icon for visual and eco for auditory information. And so, this information, these raw inputs is fed on to something called the central executive. What does the central executive do? The attentional control system modality which is modality free and limited capacity. So, it takes in this information and then pushes this information to two sub stores which are there. One sub store is called the phonological loop. What does the phonological loop do? It has an articulatory control system. So, verbal rehearsal system, time capacity and the inner voice. We have dealt again I will say that we have dealt with this working memory system or working memory in my text on cognitive psychology please refer there if you want more details but basic information I am going to give you here. And then there is something called a phonological store. The phonological store is speech based uh, storage system, decay rate is 2 seconds and there it lies in the inner ear. So, then information which is in the auditory nature which is echoic information is pushed onto the phonological store and what the phonological store does is takes this information and keeps on rehearsing it or repeating it through a phonological loop. Information which is of the visual nature is pushed on to something called the sketch uh, sketch pad, which is petal and visual uh, information storage system has limited capacity and is it in the inner eye. Now, in, a, in relation to this, there is also a store which is called the episodic buffer. And what is the episodic buffer actually doing? 
the episodic buffer not only combines information from this to store but also talks to the long term memory for so there is a long term store assuming that this is my long term store the episodic buffer takes in information from this to store takes in commands from the central executive and talks to the long term memory for pulling out the rules or pulling out any kind of explanations which is needed for interpreting incoming information from the short term store so this is what my conceptualization of working memories and so if you look at working memory so a b c 1 2 3 this is the phonological loop then 45 plus 7 equals to this is the central executive it is what is uh, it, it doing so this is the phonological loop this is the visual sketch sketch pad so all visual and uh, spatial relation and if you look at the brain areas the phonological loop which is in the left hemisphere so broca's area speech area wernicke area angular gyrus and visual cortex auditory cortex central executive these are the areas for the visual spatial sketch pad is the right hemisphere the where uh, where system the spatial information visual spatial information motion object color faces all these systems composed of the visual spatial sketch pad working memory so what is the capacity of working memory the capacity of working memory is limited for the phonological loop memory span is is seven items given or taken seven plus or minus two again it is seven plus or minus two chunks of item which the phonological loop can actually store what is chunking can help us long term memory to perform chunking recording new materials into large more meaningful units and storing those into working memory so chunking is the process where we organize information which are similar or which appear similar into uh, into holes and then how is forgetting happening occurs either because items decay over time and are displaced by newer items so how does items forget from uh, working memory what happens is if you don't uh, repeat an item don't use an item for longer periods of time or for less than 30 seconds if you do not use an item what will happen is it will decay it will move out of working memory or it is displaced by new incoming information because the storage capacity is less so if 7 plus or minus 2 is my storage capacity and if you are not using this information for say let's say 30 seconds what will happen is new information always throws away old information working memory working memory and thought when conscious problem solving we often use working memory to store parts of the problem as well as relevant information accessed from long term memory so what is the evidence for working memory these are the evidence when we are doing some kind of problem solving when we are doing some kind of problem identification and problem solving um, questions then what we do is we solve part of the question and keep it in working memory and then try solving some other part of the question and integrating them together and that is the evidence for the idea of working memory transfer from working memory to long term memory how does information transfer from working memory to long term memory through something called rehearsal process of conscious repetition of information which maintains an item in working memory maintenance rehearsal but can also cause it to be transferred to long term memory by elaborate rehearsal so the same processes that happen in the short term store or short term memory is true for what happens in working memory or the concept of working memory although the recent versions of concepts of working memory or how working memory looks or what are the ways in which working memory functions is is a new dynamic idea so uh, we will not go into the details of what is the current conceptualization of working memory because now they talk of something called a single store system and so information lies at different depths so now memory is thought of a single system where there are different depths and information goes into different depths through the processes so depending on what process you are using or what kind of rehearsal you are doing information will either be stored at something called long term memory or working memory and the depth of that uh, the kind of rehearsal will de decide where the information is going and so that is the concept, uh, present conceptualization but we are not here for discussing that now memory for factual information which is episodic and semantic memory now we look at the conceptualization of how long term memory functions now the long term memory that we talk about is divided into two parts we have the conscious part and we have the unconscious part so we have something called explicit memory and implicit memory right explicit memory is called explicit long term memory is called declarative and implicit long term memory is called the procedural so yes yeah, so i'll just draw it here my long term memory up till now we have been looking at the sensory store and the short term memory or the working memory now we'll deal with what is long term memory so long term memory is basically divided into two parts we have something called the declarative store and something called the procedural store now declarative is the explicit form of memory 
which we are aware of and procedural is a part of memory which is implicit. Let me give an example to make you understand what is explicit and implicit. What is declarative memory? It is explicit in nature. For example, if I ask you what is the capital of United States? Questions like where is east from your current position? Questions like how many cents make a dollar? Questions like uh, what is the color of the Norwegian flag or who is the prime minister of some country or, or questions like what did you do in your second birthday or third birthday or first day in school. This question comprises of information which is explicit in nature and they are tackling with or they are dealing with the declarative uh, memories or information which you are aware of and you can access. There are other information which lies on the procedural memory which are implicit in nature. For example, questions like how do you ride a bicycle? Now, no matter how hard you try, it is very difficult to explain how do you ride a bicycle because it is motor memory or how do you play guitar. Now, if, if I try writing a 21 day book uh, in riding a bicycle or playing a guitar, it is very difficult to explain someone how to ride a bicycle. You can do it and so they are implicit in nature. So, two forms of memory. Now, within the declarative type, I have two main types. One is called the semantic memory, which is semantic, which is for facts, knowledge rules and so on and so forth and the other end I have episodic store which are composed of episodes for example first day in school, first day in college, first case, first birthday, not first just anything experience at the mall and so on and so forth which has which is an episode which is kind of an event in your life and so that is stored in the episodic store. Within the procedural generally there are three systems one is called the habit formation so habits are procedural memory you have classical conditioning another kind of procedural memory emotional memory is another kind of procedural memory and so there are uh, other types of procedural memory as well and within them lies something called emotional memory which is sitting right between these two type of memory types. So, this is how my long term store is organized. My long term in, uh, memory store has declarative and procedural parts and within the declarative part I have semantic and uh, episodic. Within the procedural part I have something called habit formation, classical conditioning uh, and priming and so uh, so many other kind of memory stores which are there. So, since we are not dealing in detail the procedural memory type, let us look at the two different uh, declarative memory types. It is very difficult to study the procedural type of memory because it requires you special technique for developing what is priming, semantic and conceptual priming and so on and so forth. Let us just confine ourselves with what kind of information are stored in the long term memory. So, memory for factual information, episodic and semantic. Now, memory for factual information is sometimes towards the explicit or declarative memory because we can bring into consciousness and report it verbally. They are of two types, one is called the episodic memory. What is it? It holds in information that we acquire at specific time and place. So, it has something called autoneotic consciousness which basically means that it has a certain place and certain time. These memories can actually be plotted on a place time axis, on a space time axis and so these are episodic in nature and these memories always unfold in a timely manner. For example, if you think about your first day at uh, whatever college you are studying in, then the memory which unfolds happens in a timely manner which means that the first day will start with morning and then it will tell you all the events that happened one by one in a time sequence and a space sequence and that is what is the idea of autoneotic consciousness. Now, it is the kind of memory that allows you to go back in time and to remember specific thoughts and experiences you had in the past and so it is also called time traveling memory right. So, who says that time travel is not possible? It is possible. If you look at episodic memory, what we are actually doing is we are traveling back in time and going to a place or going to a, a, a system where we can leave that particular memory and so we are doing time traveling. Now, another kind of memory which is the long term part or declarative long term part is semantic memory which holds information of more general nature, information we do not remember or acquire at a specific place and time. For example, information who is what is the capital of? Finland or questions like who is the president of Canada, these kind of information or information uh, about how do we integrate pi by 2 to minus pi by 2 cos x this kind of information, simple integration, simple differentiations, all those kind of rules are there sin x plus cos x and so on 
that kind of a thing. So, these are rules and they, they are not stuck to one place time, but these are general things that you actually store. Episodic memory, some factors that affect it. What are uh, so some of the factors which affect um, episodic memories are one is the amount of spacing and practice. How much in uh, spacing that you do or how much time has elapsed between uh, you experiencing a particular event. The more time that has elapsed, the more the better the memory will be. But if you club to remember the, the idea about spacing that we did in the first slide where we looked at how even goes um, uh, did something called uh, uh, mass practice versus uh, space practice the same thing is there. So, the more time you provide or the lesser time you provide to particular kind of episodic memory the better the retrieval be or how the uh, the retrieval will be of those memory items. Also, the kind of processing that they perform. So, episodic memory is also dependent on the kind of uh, processing that we uh, do. So, if we do maintenance rehearsal, remember what is maintenance rehearsal? It is repeating an information passively over and over again just for the sake of it that is called maintenance rehearsal. The kind of memory that we will have is uh, very low uh, grade and it will be uh, there for very uh, less period of time. But if we do elaborate rehearsal, if we make meaning or attach meaning to information which is uh, which is presented to us, then it is called elaborate rehearsal. And in this cases, what will happen is the information will store will stay with you for longer periods of time, and a high grade information uh, is what will be available with you. Also, retrieval cues also decide what kind of information or the one of the factor which decides how episodic mem uh, memory functions. So, stimuli that are associated with information stored in memory and so can bring the information to mind at times when it can be recalled is what is called the retrieval cue. Now, basically if you look at the memory, any memory follows a lock and key kind of a paradigm. So, think of this as a lock, this is my memory. Now, any memory is actually a lock and cues are known to be the keys. So, then this is the key and cues are key and this key actually fits a lock. Now, what happens in terms of memory is that there are many keys. A same memory can be extracted through a number of cues. Let us say that in your 12th class farewell, you had a bad experience, right? So, you went into a fight and you got slapped by someone or something something. Now, whenever how do you remember this event this 12th class farewell? There can be several ways one is the fight obviously right. The other way is remembering the last day of 12th class this these these packets of information or these terms that I am telling you are the cues. You can also remember 12th class farewell by the nice smile that you got from your lady friend or, or any other reason. So, the same event can be extracted or can be pulled up from different different cues and so these cues are the keys that fit into the lock. So, the memory is generally the lock and the key or uh, that that opens it or the key that through which you can access it is called the cues. So, these cues which extract information or which bring information to the forefront or which help you remember information is responsible for how well a memory is stored into long term store. So, there are two type of cues one is called the context dependent cue the other is called the state uh, dependent retriever or state dependent cue. What is the context dependent? Now, within the context dependent cue what happened is the context in which you learned information will decide uh, how well you will remember if the context remains the same. What is the meaning of it? Now, all of us when we give an exam and when we are giving the exam in the same room in which the lectures was held, we remember it better than if we are giving the exam in some other school. What happens is it has happened to all of us, it, has, it will happen to you also. And there are times when we actually try to remember an answer and then we remember the context which basically means that we remember everything which was written on that page, but we do not remember what the answer was or how it was solved. We remember the flowers that we made on the notepad, we remember the lines that were there, the color of the notebook which was there, the kind of pen that we used, the teacher who was teaching it, we remember everything, but not the exact answer. And so, this is called context de dependent effect. So, basically where you learn an object where you learn a particular information if it is tested in the same medium then the retrieval is better or the memory is better than when it is tested in some other medium and a small experiment was done uh, to test this. So, basically two type of uh, people were used divers were used and these divers were given some information to learn. So, this is a list of items that these divers are learning. Now, there are two cases one case is the diver learned the information. So, information learned on in land 
and then later on the diver took a dive and under water it tried to recall the information. In the other case, the diver learned a list of words under water and then later on it was tested for these items under water and on land. So, two cases driver learned information on land, diver learned information on under water and then the testing happened in two conditions. This is under water, the words were remembered and on land, the words were remembered. This is under water, the words were remembered and on land, the words were remembered. What do you think happened? If the information was learned on land, the retrieval was better on. So, this is high retrieval and in this case the retrieval was very poor, right. So, if you learn an information on land, the chances of you retrieving this information on land is very high, but if you remember an information on land, go underwater and try to retrieve that information, the chances are very less that you will be able to retrieve and similar happens when you learn information underwater. There are some state dependent effects also, certain states are memory states are also responsible for you to learn information in a uh, nice manner and so nothing to explain here. So, if you learn something when you are drunk, you recall that when you are drunk better than when it is you are sober and so certain kind of information only comes to us when we are drunk. You have, might have friends of you uh, who actually break when they are drunk and they do not even remember what they keep on telling when they are drunk. So, basically some informations are remembered better because they happen, uh, this kind of information were learned when, the, when you are drunk and so certain uh, body physiological states uh, are responsible for coding this kind of information. Now, semantic memory, information organization. Now, what is semantic memory? Memory for general knowledge stores a large amount of information in highly organized structures. Organization in semantic memory uses elements like. So, basically if we looked at how information is stored in episodic memory, but in semantic memory information is stored in terms of a network, right. So, any information that happens in a semantic memory, it is stored in kind of networks which is composed of nodes and sub nodes. For example, let us look at the information animal. So, animal is a concept and within the animal you will have birds and reptiles and within the birds and reptiles you will have within the birds you will have information like that. So, if you look into it, it is like a node, the top node is the animal within that you have birds and um, uh, reptiles and mammals and within the birds you will have different kind of birds, within the reptiles you have different kind of reptiles, within the mammals you will have different kind of an animals. So, basically information is arranged in a highly organized structure and the organization is using elements like something called concept. Now, what is a concept? It is a mental category for object or event that are similar to one another in certain ways. Concepts in semantic memory seem to exist in networks reflecting the relationship between them which is called the semantic network. As I said, within animals you will have birds and so all kind of words will be structured here. But within word you will have, you may have two different kind of words. For example, talking words, non-talking words, words which can be domesticated, words which cannot be domesticated, uh, words which are non-birds. For example, you have emu or ostrich which are birds but non or hen which are birds but non-birds and so on and so forth. So, that is the kind of thing. So, here is the concept of animal and here is the concept of bird and here is the kind of concept of different birds and so on and so forth and this is how it is uh, stored, information is stored in uh, semantic memory. The meaning of concept reflects in links or association with the adjoining concept. For example, if I am looking at animals, so animal is one concept. So, all four footed beings which can walk, locomote, uh, make their own food are animals and within the animals you will have let us say mammals first and birds. So, egg laying versus uh, giving uh, birth to babies and within birds you will have let us say feathered and non feathered. As you can see this is a concept, this is a concept, this is a concept and so on and so forth and the, these are, so within the feathered you will have let us say parrot, this is called an exemplar because this is a type of feathered word, right. And so, this, these are the nodes which are there as you see information passes through this and this is the connector. So, this is how information is. So, meaning of concept reflects the link or association with adjoining concepts. For example, how mam so within mammals you will have simple mammals and complex mammals. So, you will have uh, chimpanzees versus bears and so on and so forth that kind of a thing. Now, how are concepts derived? Now, how, how are these animals and uh, birds like concepts derived? They are derived from something called 
prototypes abstract idealized representation that capture an average of a typical information or member of the category so for example how is the prototype of an animal described so if i say think of an animal and tell me what it looks like what you do is you think about an animal and the animalist of animal so you will take four or five animals think about four or five animals and extract the commonality between them so what will have animal have most animals have four footed and then they have semi developed brain they locomote move from one place to another and they cannot make their own food so this is what the definition of animal is and this is how a prototype is defined or prototype of a car so car is a uh, basically a vehicle which has four uh, wheels runs on engine and used for transporting vehicle so this kind of a categorization conceptualization or abstraction is what is prototype exemplars exemplars are the examples from which the prototypes are defined so an example of the category that the individual can readily bring into mind for example if i think about animal if i want to derive the prototype of an animal and i'm thinking about uh, let's say lion is an exemplar right or similarly when i am thinking about uh, hyundai or bmw this is basically a exemplar so as you can see if bitter is my concept this bitter is actually related to two more concepts one bitter is related to beer bitter is also related to resentful on one end if you look at beer this is related to further concepts or further links into it for example beers are there are different kinds of beers you have lager you have the ale and so on and so forth different kind of beers are there and within the beer it is again related to wine for example the sherry wine the apentrif wine and wine is again related to cheese and so on and so forth but if you look at bitter it is related also to an emotion so this is a drink a food item but bitter is also related to human emotion which is resentful and resentful is then further related to spiteful angry envious all of which are human emotions and then bitter is related to sour wine is related to cheese and both are savory items which are spicy and piquant so that gives you a definition of how things are related in semantic memory or how they are organized in semantic memory again if you go back to my lecture on cognitive psychology uh, what i have done is i have looked at these details or these memories in full chapters or full lectures so you can refer to those lectures memory for skills which is procedural memory so memory system that retain information we cannot readily express verbally for example information necessary to perform skill motor activities such as riding a bicycle it's also called implicit in nature so no matter how hard you try you cannot explain how do you ride a bicycle and that is what is uh, the memory for skill or procedural memory now support for the existence of procedural memory comes from the phenomena of priming the fact that having seen a heard a stimuli once may facilitate you to recognizing it on a later occasion even if we are unaware that this is happening so priming is a situation when parcel information is given to you for example uh, some new friend of yours comes in and uh, a new person comes in your hostel and before you meet him somebody provides some partial information about this person so when meeting this person you will use this partial information in forming a impression of this person or forming an uh, or designing a talk with this person and that is what is called priming in priming what happens is partial information or some kind of very reduced information is given to you and this reduced information or this low grade information is used by you to make meaning later on at some point of time or help you in making meaning at a later point of time is what is priming and so priming basically uh, supports the fact that procedural memory exists forgetting so memory is mostly appreciated when it fails that is when forgetting occurs earliest view of forgetting suggests that information in long term memory fades or decays with the passage of time causing forgetting so the earlier views of memory believes that information actually is forgotten so any information from either the long term store or the short term store it how do you forget it through decay or fading however research on forgetting suggests that forgetting is not only a function of time but also depends on the intervening events between learning and retesting so forgetting is not only time dependent forgetting is not only dependent on time it is also dependent on what kind of information is learned in between learning and testing of an information and so that is what is called interference so forgetting as a result of interference forgetting can be caused by uh, interference between items of information stored in memory such interference can be retroactive in nature so what kind of retroactive information when learning and when uh, learning and retrieving an information is between the learning and retrieving of an information is filled with learning or of another kind of information is what is interference so if some information 
blocks your remembrance of some other information this is what is interference so what is retroactive uh, inf uh, interference information currently being learned interfere with information already presented in memory that is called retroactive and what is proactive interference previously learned information uh, presented in long term memory interferes with information currently being learned and that is what is proactive so let's take a quick example for example if you are studying french and then uh, to study Spanish and if I in the mid semester examination I take a test of Spanish. So, what will happen is words from French will interfere with words from Spanish and this is basically called uh, one kind of information which is proactive. But then if you study French and then you study Spanish and I take the examination of French. So, st words from Spanish will interfere with the remembering of words from French that is called the retroactive interference. Now, forgetting and retrieval inhibition. Forgetting does not only happen uh, in terms of time based or event based or stimuli based forgetting. There is also forgetting happening from retrieval from the process of forgetting itself. How you forget or how you remember or how you actually uh, retrieve an information that also can cause forgetting. So, basically imagine a task which requires you to name all the states in India. Now, how many could you report correctly? Would it help you if you provide with the name of half of the states and required to recall the other half? No, it will be difficult because what will happen is you learn the states in a particular manner. But if I keep on giving you names of state, what will happen is you will go over the states again and again and so there are two process one is remembering the other is matching and that can cause forgetting and that is called retrieval inhibition. Now, the act of retrieval itself can cause forgetting not of the information recalled but of other related information. Now, this phenomena is known as retrieval inhibition and it occurrence has been observed in serial experiments. So, what happens here is that when I give you the task of remembering something the very act of remembering this information actually causes forgetting and that type of forgetting or that type of feature through which forgetting happens is called retrieval induced or retrieval inhibition. Now, memory as I said is never accurate. The, the reason why memories are never accurate is because there is no way to look at how what memories are stored. Memories are subjected to personal biases. People add their own bias. So, when I am looking at an incident, any incident for that matter, if I look at car incident uh, or car accident incident, what will happen is my own bias, my own interpretations will influence what I store in memory and so they are never accurate. So, memories are always open to distortions and constructions. So, information entered into memory is often altered in various ways over time and those alterations can reduce its accuracy and change its meaning. Now, this can be of two types, one is called memory distortions, alterations in what is retained and later recalled and the second is called instructions the addition of information into initially present information. So, basically this memory accuracy is affected by distortions where alterations or, or in what is retained happens and constructions where new information which is fitting the schema which is fitting the kind of information that is already been stored can also lead to memory constructions. Distortions and the influence of schemas. Distortions in memory can occur in response to false or misleading information provided by others. Now, the cause of such distortions in many cases seem to involve operations of schema, structures representing individuals knowledge and assumptions about aspects of the world. Now, for example, if I know that some information you have in memory, for example, if I am cross checking someone, I am in an eyewitness testimony case and I am cross checking someone and the eyewitness says that it, the person who committed the murder was actually wearing a dark color suit. So, uh, or and he insists on that it is blue. I can obviously play with the schema and, and make him believe that it was not a blue color suit, but it was a gray color suit because both of them are dark in color and more or less steel gray is very equivalent to or very close to blue. And so, I can infuse schemas that, like that or you can I can infuse false memory like that and that is what is playing around with the schema. Now, another important cause of distortions in memory involves our motives. We often distort our memories in order to bring them in line with what whatever goals we are currently seeking. And at times, we save memory as I said dependent on what we want it to happen. If we want something good to happen, no matter how an incident was, the way we encoded memory, the way we encode memory is in terms of what we want. So, suppose uh, I got rejected by a female friend, but I do not want this to be in this way. So, I will remember the memory in an entirely different way, the way I want it to be. And so, there will be two versions of the actual memory happening and that is called distortions of memory.
memory distortions and memory construction. A final way of memory distortion involves confusions concerning the sources of information in memory. Sometimes what happens is you do not know where the memory came from or where it is stored or who actually said you and those type of problems can also lead to memory distortions and constructions and that is called the source monitoring error. Now we are often make errors in source monitoring the process of identifying the origins of a specific kind of memory. Now a related effect is called reality monitoring. Sometimes memory comes to us and we, we even do not know whether these memories are real or not. For example, certain people have remember certain events from their life where they are very unsure of whether these events actually happen to them or not and that is they fall prey to something called reality monitoring. Now the process of deciding whether memory uh, stems from an external sources which is events we accurately experience or from internal sources our imagination or thought and that is called the problems in reality monitoring and that can lead to distortions or uh, memory constructions. Memory construction remembering what is not happening. Not only can memories be distorted, they can also be constructed. False memories are both persistent and convincing and people strongly believe that they actually happen. Eyewitness testimony is a good example, it is the accurate as we believe. Eyewitness testimony evidence is given by persons who having witnessed a crime plays an important role in many trials. So basically eyewitness testimony is affected by a lot of things uh, that is beyond the control of the person who is actually giving the, the eyewitness testimony. So, factors affecting the accuracy of eyewitness testimony, one is suggestibility. Witnesses are sometimes influenced by leading questions and similar techniques used by attorneys or police officers. So, they uh, make you believe that certain things happen and you start believing them. Also something called source monitoring, attributing one's memory to wrong sources. Sometimes the police tells you or the person who is questioning you in the court tells you a different story altogether or gives you a different source from where the memory could have come and that can lead to the throwing out of the eyewitness testimony. Illusions of outgrowth homogeneity, another reason uh, or another kind of memory distortion happens from the illusion of outgroup homogeneity. What is it? The fact that people outside our own group seem more similar in appearance and characteristics than people within our own group. So, for example, whites like to prefer to believe that all whites are good and blacks like to believe that all blacks are bad or if you are in uh, traveling in New York and you see a black immediately the idea that he is a thief comes to your uh, mind and that kind of a uh, construction is there or that kind of a plausibility is there. Enhancing eyewitness uh, accuracy. So, if these are the problems which can happen to eyewitness testimony, how do we increase the eyewitness accuracy? One is called cognitive interview. Interviews that enhance the ability to remember crucial information accurately when they happen at multiple retrieval so, I can use something called cognitive interview. In cognitive interview, what we do is we go into the details of information. For example, somebody is telling me some information, somebody is relating me some information now, or some event. Now, I can keep on asking questions like when did this happen, where did this happen, what was the time, what was the color of the dress you were wearing, were you holding it in the right hand, left hand. So, if I keep on doing this cognitive interviewing where I am looking at the details of the memory, the, uh, it might increase the eyewitness ac uh, accuracy. Also, hypnosis, a process through which you can be thrown into a suggestible state can increase eyewitness memory. Memory in everyday life, so everyday memories. Now, how does memory function in natural context? Three topics are separate interest are there. One is repression of uh, traumatic events. Now, do people repress traumatic events of their life? Psychologists view that there is a skepticism with the following reason. Now, despite its widespread acceptance, there is still very little scientific evidence to support the theory of repression. It is believed that psychologists believe that there are very less chance that people actually repress information from their everyday life or non-traumatic information. In some instances, therapists may act as ways to lead uh, to clients to repress their memories even if they do not really have them. And uh, the reasoning that has been provided is that psychologists believe that sometimes it is a therapist who actually gives the memory to uh, people and they repress this memory later on and it is not their actual memory. What happens is when they go into the therapy sessions, the memories that they are trying to remember, they are trying to deal with is actually provided by the therapist. Also people may have repressed memories but may get influenced by the media reports that claim that their memories are a common phenomena. Sometimes media reports are such that people start believing that something happened with them or this kind of information whatever the media is floating that happened with them also and they start believing that such kind of events happened with them. People may also generate false memories for events that never actually happened because of these reasons. 
memory in everyday life. There is something called another kind of memory which is called autobiographical memory. This is memory for information about events in our own lives uh, which fall under the category of episodic memory. Such memories are studied using either detailed questionnaire or diary method. Now information from your personal life it is very difficult to study and so the, the only way to do it is through a diary method. The correctness of this is very difficult to assess. So these kind of memories are also there autobiographical memory, your personal memory and so they are studied using the diary method. Now there are also memories for emotionally laden events which are called flashbulb memories and what are they? These are vivid memories of what we were doing at a time of an emotion provoking event. For example, when the 9-11 happened or the 26 11 happened. Now all this time 26, 7 I think. So whenever these events happened or when uh, Rajiv Gandhi died or some other pu public favor, some other event happened. And now what you were doing around that period of time when you heard the news for the first time, the memories for that is called the flashbulb memories. They are termed flashbulb memories because they seem to be preserved in autobiographical memory in considerable detail almost like a photograph but this has been challenged. Now flashbulb memory seem to be especially vivid or strong because they are triggered by events that are surprising, distinctive and important to the people involved. Contrary to popular belief, it is believed that they are often inaccurate. So this is what my autobiographical memory base looks like if it is type periods, event, relationship theme, work theme, general events. So event specific knowledge and this is the far side, I will leave you with this particular uh, graph or picture which actually uh, tries to detail the kind of memories that we have and how they interact with each other. Okay. So what we did today, do a little recap of what we did today, what we did today was we moved on from where we left in the last section. So in the last section what we did was we were uh, dealing with two different influential views of memory and how recall and re, uh, retrieval and uh, the encoding retrieval and storage were three processes in memory. What we build up today is what happens with memory. So what is the nature of working memory? How does it really work? What are the parts of working memory? And then further on took the discussions to the idea of what is long term memory and what are the parts of it? What are the factors which influence long term memory? Uh, what are the other kinds of human memory which are there and how they function? And what is semantic and, and episodic memory? What is procedural memory and so on and so so, forth. so, we detailed on these things uh, in, in this lecture and we moved ahead from where, where we started in the uh, last lecture. So, in, in total, we did a complete capsule of what is memory and how it is related to the understanding of human behavior. Now, again, I will uh, tell you that if you want to study any of these uh, human uh, cognitive processes in detail, you can refer back to my lecture on cognitive psychology where we deal with each of these memory types in detail in, in on, on those lectures. So, uh, up till the next time when we meet and we deal another interesting topic in human behavior is goodbye from here. Thank you.